Okay, so here, um, this is homework two. And the topic is, um, as I mentioned last time, uh, in implementing the naive base email spam filter. Um, and for this, um, there are three exercises. Um, so recall um, the idea of this naive base email spam filter was that we have a dictionary, which was just a collection of words. And then we uh, encoded an email by writing it as, an, uh, as a vector of zeros and ones. And uh, one indicated that the word at this position in the dictionary is contained in the email. So for example, here I gave a really simple dictionary. Maybe you can by yourself create maybe more interesting dictionaries, but I created one in the list of emails so we can later compare our results. And so here the dictionary contains a few words like hello students, please learn and so on. And then I give you also a list of um, test emails. And by this, I mean, I give you an array of arrays. So here, uh, I don't know how many emails I have, but um, each email has a text and then it indicates if this is a spam or not spam. Yeah, so maybe really let's just do it slowly. So let me run this, oops. So here, for example, I can check test emails. Um, the, the first entry, um, this will give me this entry here. And if I want to actually get the, the text of this email, I can take the, the first entry of this. So this will be give me the email of the first uh, data set here. And the second entry then will tell me if this is spam or not spam. So in this case, this will give me a zero. And your first task is it um, to, um, to convert these emails into a feature vector. So in our example, we had this um, feature space X, which was given by these vectors of zeros and ones, where D is uh, the size of the dictionary. And the first exercise here is um, to actually convert such an email into a vector. Um, so, so you should write a, a function here, um, which we denote by email to feature, um, where you give as an input a dictionary and you also input a text. Um, so maybe, I don't know how much I should say, but um, for this, you, you will need to look up some functions in Python. Um, so for example, let's do an example. Let's take an email and say, hello, today is the picture of you. So this is an email, but also in this email, there are some words with, which are not in the dictionary, but uh, let's not care about this. And for example, I now want to convert this into um, a vector. So let's maybe first check how many words we have in the dictionary. Um, I think it should give me the... Oh. So now our dictionary have uh, 39 words. Um, so what we want to write is a function which converts this string here into a vector of size 39, which zeros and ones. And um, for this, what you would need to do is you would need to go through the dictionary and check for each word in the dictionary if this word is contained in the string or not. Um, so maybe Maybe for some of you, this is not really boring, but maybe also some are not so familiar. Um, so I want to do it slowly. Um, so maybe let's go um, like this. So this will now go from um, zero to 38. And for example, if we would just print dictionary um, at this position J, then this will just now give a list of the words in the dictionary. 
But for example, in this example here, we want to check if this word, for example, is contained in email. So what we can do to, to check this in Python, it's quite simple. So um, we can ask if, and then this is now the word at the position J in this uh, dictionary, and we can just ask in email. So this here will just check if this word is contained actually in this string. And then we can say, for example, in this case, So what this will now do is it goes through the dictionary and checks if this word is contained uh, in this string here. And then we see from these 39 words, we have hello is contained there, today is how are you uh, in this email. And similar um, for this homework here, for, to write this function, you will get an email like this text here and you give this a dictionary and you should return a vector. So maybe you will just start with a vector, uh, which is just zeros everywhere. And then depending if, if this statement here is true or not, you will put the one there on. And this uh, set second function here, um, what you should do there is uh, you should convert uh, these test emails, uh, which are given by these arrays of arrays into a new array of arrays where instead of having the text in the first entry, you will have this feature vector. So this then should correspond really to um, what we call a, a training set, an array of tuples where the first entry is really an element in our feature space. Um, but if you implemented the first function, I think the second function um, is clear, hopefully. And then um, the main task of this homework is uh, to implement this algorithm we described in the, in the lecture. So um, for this, we, um, we introduce these phi's. Um, so these phi's here, I denoted in the lecture with a phi tilde, um, because this tilde meant that I use this, um, uh, this Laplace smoothing, but here I just called them uh, phi. Um, so if you compare it to the lecture notes, maybe th the only difference will be that there are no uh, tildes here. And, um, and they can be calculated completely out of these uh, training sets. So these two are arrays of size D, and this here is just the number. Um, so, and then having these numbers, so this is what we learn by the training, then getting a new email means someone sends us a text. Then this text we can convert into a vector by using the function in exercise one. And then for this vector, um, we can calculate these uh, probabilities. Um, so these are all four possible cases um, for this probability. Either the, the word is contained or um, the, this, it, it's spam. Um, and so on. So we have all four possibilities here, and these can be calculated by using these phi's, which you now, if you implemented them at this point, you can uh, use them. Um, there's a question in the training set, the n and x n. Yes, so this n here is the number of trainings emails. Um, so Actually, in our case here, n would be the length of this test emails. In our case, this n is 14. So because we have 14 emails here, and for each email, we have a feature vector, and for each email, we have um, zero or one, depending on if this is spam or not. And, but these numbers, these phi's you calculate for each word. So these phi's, this and this will all, both will be an area of size, in this case, 39. Um, but this n here and the sum, this is the sum over these 14 uh, training email. Okay, and then I'm um, having these numbers, you get a new email, meaning you have a new vector x, and then you can calculate this probability here, px, um, 
I'm given y, which is a product of these, these p's, which, which can be calculated by these phi's. And therefore you can calculate this expression here, which says that given a new email x as a vector, what is the probability that this is spam? Um, so this formula we introduced in the lecture and then you need to calculate this expression here, which is, um, so this expression here just uh, uses these numbers here. So if you solve exercise two, so exercise two is to implement a function for this here, namely uh, what you want in the end is a function which gets an email as a text, and then it should return a percentage of this email being spam. And maybe um, uh, you don't want to put everything into this uh, uh, thing here. So maybe at, at this point before, maybe you just um, start creating your, your arrays for the files and then maybe write a function to evaluate this thing here um, and so on and then do it step by step. And then in the end, maybe in this function, you will just implement um, this final formula here. But um, yeah, we didn't want to give uh, a lot of restriction here. So you can implement it however you want. Uh, so maybe some of you will do it much better than I did it in the solution I wrote. Um, yeah, and then, so there's a small typo here because we changed the name. Um, so, so in the end, you should all check, so we can compare it later, what the spam percentage for this email here is given, given this training data and this dictionary here. Um, and then I hope we come all, we get all the same percentage for this email. And I think the percentage that this is in spam email is quite high, but here this function uh, should be this function. So uh, don't be confused. Uh, so this is what you should uh, execute in the end. And then this gives a number and this helps us to compare um, with your solution. And then in the end, uh, like a bonus exercise, uh, maybe for those um, where the first part is a little bit boring. I mean, maybe some of you can extend it a little bit in a way, uh, and one way to extend it, for example, is um, to create a dictionary out of emails. Um, so instead of writing a dictionary, maybe you just get a list of emails and then you go through each email and collect the words, but then you need to take care that you don't collect them twice. Because for example, here, if I go through these emails and create a dictionary, I need to be careful that I don't put hello six or five times into this uh, dictionary. Um, but maybe some of you have even nice ideas um, uh, to extend the spam filter. Are there any questions on this? So maybe tomorrow in the study session, um, you can go th th through this uh, together. And especially those maybe who don't have any Python experience, um, I hope this is a good start because um, I think you don't need a lot of Python here. You just need to know how to use a for loop, go through some arrays um, and know, need to know things like this, that you can check if a word co is contained in another, if a string is contained in another string, you can just use uh, this word in here. Um, yeah. Okay, so if there are no questions, then I would stop sharing this. Uh, so the question when is deadline? Um, I think we did a three weeks deadline, but I think there's not really a deadline in the class. So there's an official deadline in the classroom, but I think we can still access your uh, solutions afterwards also. Um, so we still didn't really figure it out how to use uh, GitHub classrooms. Uh, but maybe just try to do it before Christmas and then that's fine. Okay. Okay, um, so today uh, I want to continue on these uh, support vector machines, um, but um, actually I, I needed to give a Japanese talk today. So I didn't have much time to uh, prepare this lecture. So I will maybe do a lot of handwriting today. Um, but let's recall what we did last time a little bit, um, what was the main idea 
of um, these support vector machines. So, so the main, the rough idea was that um, we want to separate certain uh, data sets. So the feature space um, will be something in Rd, where D is the number of uh, features. For example, in this picture here, um, D equals two. And um, the label space will be again uh, minus one or one, or similar to the spam filter where it was zero and one, but in our case, we want to be want it to be a minus one and one. But again, it's uh, an example of a binary classification problem. And what we want to do is in the first step of this thing, we want to separate these data points um, by a line. Um, but of course, in real life application, the data points will not look nicely like this. They will look uh, quite complicated, but still there will be the so-called kernel trick where we will view them in a, a higher dimensional space. And in this higher dimensional space, we can maybe separate them uh, by a hyperplane. And um, yeah, but um, today we will still talk about um, how to solve this simple case here. And um, for this, we recall some linear algebra, namely the, the dot product, um, because with a dot product, we are able to describe such a hyperplane. And um, so what the dot product of two vectors um, was just given by, um, so if I have two vectors, oh, let's see. Oh, maybe let's write it directly with the, so if I have a dot product, dot product of A and B. This is just uh, A transpose uh, times B. And it has some geometric interpretation, namely if the length of B is one, then the dot product is exactly the length um, of this part here. And then we saw that if I have a vector B and I consider, for example, all vectors A such that the dot product is fixed, then I consider um, all points uh, on this line here. And this um, gives us the, prob uh, the possibility to describe a, hyper a line by using this dot product. Yes. So, so in general, um, if we have a, we use this vector W, um, which was a normal vector on the plane, and we had this number B, which in some sense corresponds uh, to the distance of this plane uh, to zero. And which is exactly the different as a distance if this w um, is has length one, and then we define this hyperplane H W B, which is exactly given by all vectors in R D, um, which satisfy this equality here. So again, in picture, <clears throat> we have some w, then. HWB is a is a plane which is um, where this W is orthogonal to. <coughs> and this B um, is basically this part. Um, if if the length of this W is one, if this is not one, then we can divide by dub the norm of W. And then this length here is B divided by W. So therefore this length in general is always uh, B divided by the length of W. Okay. Are there general questions about this form here? Okay. So then um, the, the goal we want is, um, we want to find a W and B given some um, trainings um, set. And then, so we had this example here, um, but in the end, we then saw that we want to solve um, the following problem. So here we have a training set with two labels, um, blue corresponds to one and green corresponds uh, to minus one. And what we want to, to fix is that the the points which um, um, somehow are closest to our goal um, hyperplane, that they satisfy the equation 
um, that this dot product here of w with this x minus b equals one and similar to this. And this here we call the, um, the functional margin. And then doing this, we saw that the distance here between these two lines is exactly two divided by uh, the length of w. And what is the, the perfect hyperplane in our example where the perfect hyperplane is the one where this distance here is maximal. So we want to maximize this two over w and therefore we want to minimize this w with the condition that this functional um, margin of all these um, points um, is greater equal to one. Um, because uh, these points here on this side, oh, green is bad, here on this side, they satisfy all the, the condition that the dot product here is greater equal to one. And on the other side, they satisfy that this is a smaller equal to one. And then if we multiply with the label, which on this side is plus one and on this side is minus one, then we get the equation uh, that this here, the label times uh, this thing here, so the, the functional margin should be greater or equal to one. Because this exactly means that there's no point here in, in this thing here. So that really the, the, the plane here is between the, the nearest points um, of these two classes. Okay. And so goal is um, to solve this um, problem here. And this is an example of a so-called uh, optimi optimization problem with linear constraints. And we want to rewrite this a little bit. Um, so maybe let me copy this here. And just to make sure that this is actually the same, but just written down in a different way. Um, so still we want to find h, uh, we want to find w and b, um, but we want to minimize one half um, of the norm squared. But actually this is not really a difference because uh, if we minimize uh, one half squared, then this is exactly the same as minimizing just the norm. And the only reason is that here uh, we have some square root in the definition of the norm uh, but we don't care about the square root and it's easier to just uh, work with this here. Um, because here, um, and the one half we will see because we will take the derivative with respect to w and then this two will go in front and then um, it's easier to write down. Um, so here, just to make sure, the norm squared is exactly just um, um, w times w. Oh. So in other words, if the entries are w1 up to wd, then this here is just really the sum of the squares of the entries of w. So this um, is here the part of the what we, we want to um, find the optimal value for this w. And then we have so-called linear constraints. Namely, we not, don't just want to find the minimum of this. This would be quite easy actually, but we want to find the minimum in such a way that we also have this condition here. And here, um, this is just really, oh. Oh, sorry, I want a sign change here. But this doesn't really matter um, because here I, I uh, changed the order. But this is exactly this equation here by just bringing everything on one side. So in other words, we just want to find W such that this F here is minimal with the constraints that this function G, J are smaller uh, equal to zero. Okay, 
And this is what called what is called a linear constraint because this here is a linear function uh, in W. Because this W we are just multiplying um, with some X and the X are, can be seen as some constants um, because they are our trainings examples. Yeah, again here, so this N is again the number of trainings examples, the number of points. And here, this xj is uh, the feature vector. So this is the position of the point. And this yj is just uh, plus or minus one. OK, and um, so how does such a problem look like? So in our, so this function here is something quadratic in w. So here we have a sum of squares. So for example, let's consider the case um, uh, d equals two, for example, then um, the graph of this um, thing here could would be, for example, w one squared plus w two squared. And for example, this could uh, look something like this if we would draw this and maybe have here w1 and maybe uh, w2. And if we would just need to minimize um, this function here, then we see in the picture, well, then there's, there's just exactly one point. And this point we could maybe find by just taking the derivative with respect to w1 and w2. But now we also have these linear constraints. And I want to draw now how this looks like if we have linear constraints, because then maybe this point here doesn't satisfy these linear constraints. But first, um, I want to draw this a little bit differently. Um, so maybe let's consider we, we look from top onto this thing here. So maybe now there's W1 and W2. And, um, and now for, for different values of this function, we can draw uh, uh, a line. So for example, let's say this is here the value. Uh, so maybe let's say here we have fw equals one. And maybe here we have fw equals two and so on. Okay. And here, for example, in the middle, uh, we have the minimum at, in this case, it's really simple because it's just zero. But now, uh, how do linear constraints look like in this picture? So what could be an example uh, for a linear constraint in this uh, W? Um, for example, one linear constraint could be um, two times W plus W1 plus W2, maybe, smaller equals zero. So this is a linear uh, constraint in W1 and W2. And um, so let's see how this looks in this picture. Uh, so um, how, yeah, so this should, so this constraint here, um, I mean, we can write this as w2 smaller equal uh, minus 2w1. So this is somehow, if you think of uh, y and x, this is just a line um, with, uh, which looks like this maybe. And um, smaller means that this is a part uh, on this side here. Yeah. So therefore, where this picture still with the linear constraint, um, we also have this point here. But maybe let's do also another linear constraint. Let's say, hmm, maybe let's do it easy. So for example, this here 
uh, is also a linear constraint. And this just means um, that uh, W2 is greater or equal to two. Um, so we have this constraint here. So somehow we are just allowed to find something here on top. So now um, if we want to minimize this together with these two constraints, then the optimal solution in this picture is where? Well, we know the value of f, the more we go into the center here, it gets smaller. Um, but here in this area, we are not allowed to go because in this area, um, we do not satisfy these equations. Um, so therefore, um, we need to find the point um, which is in these two areas. So the only um, area where we can look for a solution is, is this part here because this part satisfies uh, both constraints. And the area, the part in this area with the smallest value of f is exactly this point here. So in this case, if I did everything correctly, I hope this is a um, solution for w because this point satisfies these uh, two conditions and it also minimizes um, this function f. Okay, and this is an example of an optimization problem with uh, linear constraints. So, and now um, how, to, how to deal with this in, in, in general. So, um, to, to solve such a problem, uh, one considers so-called Lagrange multipliers. And so maybe let me copy again the, the problem we want to solve with the typo here. So um, we have um, here our problem. And now what we define um, is this function uh, here. Mm. Oh, I think here I also want a plus. Sorry. And now um, let's consider the, the following. Um, namely, so what we did here is um, we have the function f, which we want to minimize. And here we have um, these function g, j. So for each trainings um, example, we have this constraint. And we have these. Um, Lagrange multipliers alpha, which are now some numbers, um, which in our case uh, will be uh, positive. So they all will be positive. And let's see why we want to consider this thing. So for this first, um, we define um, theta p. So this p here stands for primal because this here is the so-called um, uh, primal um, uh, problem or primal constraints. Primal. And um, what I want to define is now theta p of w, which is uh, maximum over all alpha, where these um, uh, alpha one up to alpha n um, is greater equal to zero of this Lagrange function w b alpha. Yeah, so I fix, um, oh, sorry, here I should write also b. So I fix, for a fixed w and b, I want to consider the maximum value um, of this uh, Lagrangian um, over all possible alphas. And now assume um, that um, 
So if, if I have a W and a B, which do not satisfy this constraints here, so if, if one of these Gs um, is positive, this would mean that one of these, um, so let me write this down. So if for one J, we have that this G W um, is actually greater than zero, then this would mean um, that I can make this here um, arbitrary large, because then um, if this number here is positive, then of course um, I can make this sum here infinitely large uh, by just increasing this alpha alpha j in this case. So in this case, um, this, this theta p wb is just uh, is infinitely large, yeah? But um, if this is not the case, um, if, if all these, um, if for a fixed w and a fixed b, uh, all these uh, g's um, are uh, negative, then um, the minimal, the maximum value um, of this thing here um, is exactly um, the, the fw. Because then if, if all these numbers are smaller equal to zero, um, then the maximum value of this thing here is obtained by taking all alphas to be zero. Because otherwise, if, if an alpha is not zero, then I would subtract something from this value here and would make it smaller. So therefore, this maximum here um, is, is obtained by considering all the cases when these alphas are zero. So, so therefore, um, what we get actually is that this um, this thing here is f of w um, if f if w let's say satisfy oops, all constraints and otherwise um, it's infinity. Yeah, is this clear? So, so therefore still the, so what we want to find now is, um, so we want to find the minimal value of, of this guy here, um, because, um, the minimal value of this will give us the minimal value of fw and these constraints are satisfied because if a constraint is not satisfied then it's uh, then it explodes anyway so it's infinity but if it's um, not infinity um, and if it's minimal then um, then we get the minimal value for f okay so let me add a page here So, so what we want is minimize over all w and b, we want to minimize this m theta p w b. Yeah, so we want to find the w and b such that this is minimal because um, if it's not infinity, then this wb satisfies these constraints. And if it's minimal, this also means that the value of fw is minimal. And therefore, I mean, what was the definition of this theta p? So here we want to minimize 
W B of, and here the definition was Um, we want the minimum of the maximum of this uh, Lagrangian, yeah? <clears throat> okay, and um, now the main idea here is um, that we will um, change this order here of minimum and maximum and um, there are arguments uh, you can bring to show that in the end you will actually obtain uh, the same results. So in general, this is not the case if you have a minimum of maximum of something that you can just change the order of minimum or maximum, uh, but what one can show that in this case, this actually works. Um, and then the, the problem we will obtain is a so-called a dual problem um, of our optimization problem. So, um, so what we will define is um, theta d for the dual problem. And now um, this will be a function on alpha. And this will be given by the minimum over all w and b of this Lagrangian. And the statement is um, one can show Um, that uh, the minimum um, oops yeah so the so now the, the maximum over these alphas of this dual problem is exactly, um, will give uh, the same uh, value here. <clears throat> okay, so what we want to do now is um, we want to calculate this here and then in the end, we want to solve um, the dual problem by finding the maximum of this explicit thing here. Yeah, so it uh, maybe sounds strange, but um, we will later see that um, that this will be helpful when we consider these uh, kernels. But first, are there any questions so far? Maybe some parts are confusing. Oh, and I see I should charge my other iPad. Otherwise I cannot see your questions soon. Anyway, let's do this. So this is now uh, the so-called uh, dual problem. So, um, so again, um, so we want to consider this one here. So we want So we want to maximize this theta dual of alpha, which is given by the minimum of this here over all w and b. And so what was this in our case, this, uh, this Lagrangian, this was given by this function here. Ah. And maybe let me also copy the the function g here, so, oops. Oh 
Okay, so I hope you can see this. Maybe it's a little bit small. So maybe let's plug everything in. Um, so here we have one half um, the WTW. Um, or maybe let's write directly the, uh, yeah, let's write it WTW um, minus, and here we have the sum, J goes from one to N alpha J and uh, and here we have the y j w t x Oops. maybe here x j plus b minus 1 yeah And, oops, and everywhere here, there should be a minimum, sorry. Uh, so we want to minimize, uh, so maybe just, okay. <laughs> Is this okay? So this is now uh, plugging in um, the F here. And here um, for each J I plugged in the, so here's now minus G J of W. And we want to minimize this. So for a fixed alpha, we want to minimize this with respect to W and B. So how do I minimize this? Well, this is now just um, a quadratic function in W and B. Um, so what you would just want to do is, um, is we want to just take the derivative and set it zero. And um, because this here really corresponds um, to, a, to a graph, which looks um, like this here. And we don't have any constraints. We just want to minimize this. Um, so, um, so we really just want to find this point in this case here. And what we can do for this is just take the derivatives with respect to W and with respect to B. And by this, I mean, we take, um, because these are vectors, we just take component wise uh, the derivatives um, of this function. So um, we take the gradient with respect to W of this, and then we want to set it zero. But first, uh, let's calculate this. Um, um, so don't be scared now. So these are all vectors. Um, oh, sorry. So this is just, uh, sorry. This is just a number uh, depending on W. And so, mm, Yes, uh, so this is this here just means um, now we take the derivative with respect to all Ws. Uh, so um, so this term here, which is just a uh, you know to say, I mean this is just uh, we uh, take the derivative with respect to um, W one up to um, W d. And this vector here um, is, uh, or this uh, number here is just the sum of the squares. Um, so if I have the sum of the squares and I take the derivatives with respect to w1 with one half here, I will just get w1. If I take the derivative with respect to w2, then I just get w2. So this here will be a vector where in the first entry I have W1 of this, then W2 up to Wn. So the vector I get is just uh, W. 
And here, so now here we need to check what we get if we take the, so first of all, this part here doesn't depend on W, so this um, just vanishes. And here um, we take the, and each component here, the, uh, the derivative with respect um, to W. Um, so what we just get is, um, we could just get the, the entries of the vector X. So here we get just the sum aj, so this um, y is just a number. And here, um, I may, maybe let me write this down to make it clear. So this here just means w1, yeah, xj1 plus w2, x1, uh, x, xj2 up to w d x d j and if i in the in the ith component takes the derivative with respect to w i then i just get the ith component of this vector x j and therefore the vector i have here is just the vector um, x j yeah is this clear And um, what we want to do now is, um, so this is the derivative with respect to W. And we also take now the derivative with respect uh, uh, to B, which in this case is really just uh, a number. And um, and the only part depending on B here um, is this part. And therefore, this is just um, the sum or oh, it's minus the sum from this. Yeah. Okay. So let me copy this. And oops. And recall what we actually want. So we want to, to calculate this guy here, which is given by the minimum of this Lagrangian. And this Lagrangian is a quadratic function in this W and B, which is um, in the simplest case, like in the picture. So therefore to find the minimum, uh, we just want to set the derivative to zero. So we want that these two equations equal to zero. And the solution of this will give us the minimum of this function here. So, um, So we have this here and uh, to get, we consider that um, the derivative with respect to W of this um, is zero and also this here. So in particular, what this then means is um, if this here equals zero, this just means that this um, best W to, to solve this is given by this sum here, um, alpha j, y j, x j. And this here just means that this sum here, j from one to n alpha j, yj equals zero. Yeah? So we get um, this explicit w here as a linear combination um, of this, of this xj. 
And this we then um, want to plug in into this Lagrangian to get this um, theta d alpha. So let's uh, plug this in. So let me get the definition again here. Monitor died. Wait a second. I cannot access the menti. So if you have a question, maybe please write in the Zoom chat. I'm sorry. Mm. Okay, so now let's uh, plug this, uh, the, the value for W into this, uh, this thing here. Um, so the W is given by this uh, linear combination here. Um, so this will get confusing now, but um, so uh, let me check this. Here. Ah, yes. Yeah, so let me put this in here. So we have this part uh, transpose. So this transpose times this. I'm sorry if this is much calculation, but I want to get to one point in the end, which really is important for the next lecture. Um, and then here we still have this sum here and um, j goes from 1 to n and j and now uh, we need to plug in the w but now we need to be a little bit careful because of the naming here uh, because we need different variable name here um, so let this be an i, because we have a double sum here. So this we plug there in, also with the transpose times uh, x j plus um, this b and there's a minus, so this is a minus b times the sum j goes from 1 to n alpha j. So this now comes um, from this. So there's also still a y j. And minus this part here, minus the sum j goes from 1 uh, to n alpha j. 
Ha, okay. And now, um, first thing we see that um, this condition here, that this equals zero, um, will actually simplify something here. Namely, this will simplify um, this term here. Um, so actually, there will be no b anymore in this equation here. And um, yes, and now we can also um, write this out. Um, namely, um, yeah, we see that these two sums, oops, are actually um, the same um, if you look at this. Um, and here is one half and here is minus one. So actually in the end, um, this will be, um, but I have a different sign here. Oh, sorry. So this here is a plus. This is a plus because it's a minus and minus. So the end result is we have the sum of the alphas minus one half and then this sum here. So this is the same as this, because taking the transpose here just means, I mean, these are numbers. So the transpose of this linear combination of vectors is just the transpose of this here, similar to this. And then in both cases, um, we have the, the double sum. Um, so maybe it becomes clearer if I just also rename this here i, which is in this case doesn't change anything. But in the end, I have the sum um, one half i and j go from one to n. Then I have the product of these um, two alphas. And I have the product of these two um, um, y's. And in the end, I have the product of um, x i t times x j. In other words, what I have here is x i, the dot product with x j. Okay, and this is the, the goal where I wanted to go. So this is now the Lagrangian um, here. And what we want to do is um, we want to, to maximize this. Um, because in the end, um, we want to maximize this dual, this theta d. So we already calculated this part here. So we minimized this thing here with respect to w and b by taking the derivative and setting it to zero. This gave some conditions on this w. So now this, um, or here, so then I should also... Um, really write maybe the minimum here. Uh, the minimum over W and B, because then here we use, at this point, we use that the derivative equals zero. And therefore this in the end is um, what we here call this uh, theta D. So the dual theta depending on alpha. And the nice thing is that this function here now just depends um, on the dot product of these um, feature vectors. And um, so next time we will see how to, so the goal is, is to maximize now um, this thing here with respect to alpha. And, but later, as I said, we want to use this so-called kernel trick and go into higher dimensions. And the idea of this was to send these vectors, which are in RD, to maybe a higher dimensional space. Um, but uh, the key idea behind this is that we will actually not calculate um, this image of these vectors in the higher dimensional space. Um, the only thing we will be interested is in is how the dot product of these feature vectors in this higher dimensional space um, will look like. And this will exactly be the, the kernel 
in the end. So we really just need to know in the end the, um, the, the dot product of our feature vectors in the higher dimensional space. Um, so maybe to, to make this clear again, let me copy a, a slide from the last lecture. Uh, this one here. Um, let me copy this and put it into the So here, um, oh, well, maybe this again. Um, so we start here in this case um, in um, with our feature vectors in R D, and but here we cannot separate them. Um, but now we learned here um, to separate something in some dimensions, and we need to maximize this function he here, and this function will actually just depend on the dot product of um, our input vectors. Um, but it will not really depend on the actual vector. Um, so what we will, so actually this word here is not quite correct. So we will consider some, some phi, maybe from phi rd to phi uh, to r, I don't know, uh, m where M is maybe really, really big. So it's much larger than D. And in RM, we can um, separate these things by a hyperplane, but actually we will, we will not be interested in the value of our vectors in this space. Um, we will just be interested in, in, in the dot product of phi of let's say some input vector with phi another input vector. And um, this will then in the end be the kernel. So actually we will not calculate this map explicitly. We will just be interested in uh, calculating the dot product of two input vectors in the space here. Uh, but maybe this uh, we will do in detail next time. But the only formula I wanted to show here is this. Um, that in the end we are really interested just in the dot product of two uh, feature vectors and not in the actual coordinates of this vector. Uh, so we will actually not be interested in the coordinates here in this higher dimension. We will just be interested in, if I take two points here, we will be interested in what is the dot product of these two points. Okay, and I think this is uh, enough for today. And maybe one thing I, I think I wrote it, but I didn't mention it. Um, that in general, these problems like this, so where you want to minimize a quadratic function like this with a constraint like this. Um, so they are really um, fast implementation to solve these kinds of problems. And this is called quadratic programming. Um, so there are a lot of implementation, for example, for Python to solve such an uh, equation like this. Um, so if you're already at this point here, um, we can uh, already use some implementation for this. And, and also the, the problem we get here in the end will also be such a problem. Mm. But yeah, so maybe this I will do uh, more precisely next time. Mm.